2012 was a great year for gaming. We got legendary titles such as Dishonored, Mass Effect 3, Borderlands 2, Darksiders 2, and many others. But what was going on in the tech world at the time? Well, Microsoft was messing around with the Surface and Windows 8, Apple was making waves with their last generation of unibody MacBooks. Originally released in 2008, the unibody MacBooks replaced Apple's iBook line of laptop computers. The unibodies were special because they were durable. Most of them were milled out of a single piece of aluminum, others were made out of some sort of polycarbonate plastic, but for the most part, what we had were these uber repairable, super durable, powerful MacBook machines, and they were perfected in 2012 with the release of the A1278 and with its 15 inch and 17 inch counterparts. Ultimately, this last hurrah of this generation will go forgotten because on the day of their release, Apple announced the new confangled retina displays which boasted much higher resolution and a much thinner package. So what if I told you that these long forgotten lost machines were still useful today. These things were packed with your choice of a dual core i5 measuring at 2.5 gigahertz with a boost of 3.1 or a dual core i7 of 2.9 gigahertz with a boost of 3.6. For RAM, you can go four or eight gigabytes, both at 1600 megahertz DDR3, which was replaceable in a so dim form factor instead of being soldered to the logic board. As for storage, you had the choice between a much more sensible, larger capacity spinning disk drives or much faster SSDs that came at a cost of both lower capacity and higher money for a mere wallet. Arguably the weakest point of this machine is the display. They came equipped with a glossy LED backlit 13.3 inch screen with a native resolution of 1280 by 800. There were different specs for the 15 inch and 17 inch models, but the 13 inch is what I have. However, who needs a good display when you have this myriad of expansion? According to the press release published on Business Wire, it was the first Apple device to have Thunderbolt IO technology. It also had gigabit ethernet, two USB 3.0 ports, Firewire, and an SD card slot, which, fun fact, I used to make this video to pull the footage off my own cameras, and the amazing fan favorite MagSafe charging port. And as I mentioned before, this machine was built with Apple's unibody construction. That means it was milled out of a single piece of aluminum. Take that, HP, you flimsy plastic hinges. Okay, the hinges aren't plastic, but they're Oof. mounted to plastic, and that's just as bad. And yeah, this thing is durable. We can see that mine has taken more than a few tumbles. It's dented and scratched, and the plastic supports on the original battery, as you'll see, were completely broken. The thing was held in with hopes and dreams. But despite all that, my computer has lived through the years to fight another day. This thing saw daily use from my own mother at her job for nine years, and I've been daily driving it for the last year myself. Now I know I've been talking this thing up, so allow me to let it speak for itself. Yeah, this aluminum monstrosity plays Morrowind on OpenMW. It doesn't play it the best, but it plays it well enough to where I did an actual gaming session multiple times on this thing. So, without further ado, let's tear this beast open and I will show you how to max her out. So these are the mods that we're going to be doing. We're going to be putting in two solid state drives for dual booting. Uh, and to do that, we're going to need this uh, disk caddy that's shaped like the disk drive, and we're going to be taking out the disk drive. There's also a replacement battery, because those batteries get worn out. And we're going to be maxing out the RAM with these 16 gigabyte modules. 
You're also going to need a Phillips head and a Y head screwdriver in a very small size. I don't know the exact measurement. So when you're unscrewing the case, you're going to want to keep track of the screws. The bottom four are beveled. The two on the middle sides and on the top left are going to be normal screws. And then the three on the top right are going to be uh, much longer. So don't get those mixed up. Um, but if you do lose them, it's not the hugest deal in the world. A lot of these components come with extras. For an in-depth guide on how to disassemble and reassemble these things, I'm going to link down to the iFixit article. My device is missing like certain little pads and screws and stuff here and there, so it's really not the perfect example. So the first thing you want to do now that you have it open is disconnect your battery. Now we're going to go ahead and just remove the battery. Normally you would undo the screws and then kind of prop it up towards you and scoot it forward. Uh, I didn't bother with the screws because my battery is super broken. Next we're going to do the RAM modules. All you need to do is spread open those tabs and let them kind of pop up. They should pop up at an angle and then you uh, will remove them once they clear the tab. If the second one doesn't come right with the first one, just spread it open again and the second one will come out. You put in the new ones, you'll kind of slide them in at an angle going into the bottom first, press it down to a click and do the same for the top. Now we're going to remove the original hard drive. There are two recessed screws on this bracket right next to the disk drive. I'm just going to loosen those, pull it out, and then the disk drive comes out. It's plugged to that really sleek, nice SATA connector. On the sides of the stock hard drive, there will be these little nubs kind of sticking out the side. These are T6 screws and they use those to hold the drive into place. Unscrew that and you can put it right onto your other drive and then that'll kind of fit it right there into the laptop as if it was supposed to be there all along. So now I'm going to start undoing these ribbon connectors. And you want to be careful when you pry them up not to damage the logic board. Uh, they can be kind of delicate. We're also going to remove the connector to the board here of this kind of thicker wire and pull it to the side. All right, there's going to be three screws on this piece here. There's this one in the corner and there's going to be two more in the middle. Um, one of them's kind of recessed under that ribbon cable, so just be careful not to snag the cable. All right, and then you're gonna have a couple screws up here. My model is missing one of the screws, so I only have one, but uh, these are going to hold down this whole assembly here. We don't need to actually unplug any of these communication cables that you see. Uh, we're just gonna kind of pick it all up and it'll split apart at the middle there. And you're just gonna kind of carefully get them out of the way. All right, and now that we have that assembly moved out of the way, we can get the three screws that hold in the disk drive. Two on the side and one in the middle. There will be two on the left and then one in the middle on the right. And that'll just lift right out. Remember to take off the little SATA connector here uh, and transfer it onto the little disk caddy. We'll also have to take the uh, middle right clip off of the disk drive and transfer it over onto the caddy as well because for some reason that just didn't come on that piece. Uh, when I first installed it, I missed this step and it was only held in with two screws and it was fine. Um, but better to be safe than sorry here. Don't forget your little SATA connector. Uh, and then this will just go right back in how the disk drive came out. It's essentially identical in its shape. So it screws right into place just as a disk drive does. I'll go ahead and push in that SATA connector. And so when I was reassembling here, I found that one of my communication cables had actually frayed and broken. Uh, so you need to be really careful with that whole assembly. I've bent it back so many times, taking this thing apart and putting it back together, the wire just gave up. So especially on these older Macs, you just gotta, gotta take a little bit more care than I did. We're gonna plug in that main drive and then put the bracket back on. Then we're gonna go ahead and slot in the new battery and put the Y-head screws back in and then plug the battery in. After that, you just slap on the cover and you're good to go. And since my model is missing the feet and it's so damaged on the bottom here, I like to put on that bottom cover. It just really brings the whole thing together. From there, we're gonna go ahead and do a clean installation of OS X and get Linux Mint installed on the other drive for dual booting. 
this has been my setup for nearly a year now. I only just recently moved on to a more modern computer for my mobile computing needs. And the only reason why I did that was because I had a little bit of a panic with an OS X crash. So while I do have Linux on this device, because of the limitations of the older processor, it's not really able to run uh, Wine very well. It, it Wine has dependencies with Vulkan, and my processor doesn't support Vulkan. So, so I can't use Scrivener, which is my main app for writing. And so I have OS X on another hard drive, and I would also use that to create um, bootable media at work for any MacBooks that I have coming in to repair. So it was kind of essential for me to have OS X. Anyway, there was an update that happened, and the update corrupted OS X. And even after trying to do a fresh install, it wouldn't work. And I, the problem ended up being that I had the main drive originally in the caddy, and uh, when I switched it over back to the the normal spot where I installed it in this video, it had actually cleared up and it was fine. But that was a three and a half hour job to troubleshoot and get this thing going again when I needed to be doing homework. And, you know, so that's why I ended up switching to a more modern computer. And I'm, I'm actually kind of glad that I did because while this setup has been working for me, full transparency during the filming of this video, uh, basically what I ended up doing was I, I reverted the computer back to stock so that I could film the process of putting all the parts in. I had a frayed cable happen while I was uh, messing with those communication cables. Uh, that I don't know if that was the Bluetooth or the Wi-Fi, um, and I'm not going to find out anytime soon because when I went to power on the machine after getting it assembled, my 16 gigabyte RAM kit had failed. It was giving me the three beeps, and it was just, it was gone. It wouldn't start up. And unfortunately, that had also happened when I put the original RAM into the machine as well. Um, so currently, as of recording this voiceover, the device isn't actually functioning. And I don't think that that is a problem of the modifications or like the machine itself. I think mine is just in really rough shape and I've taken it apart about a million times and put it back together without any issues. And of course, when you record it, you're cursing yourself, right? So I was just thankful that I was able to get footage that you're watching now um, before I actually filmed the modifications. So this is how it was running uh, prior to starting the project on this video. But yeah, that is my MacBook Pro. I love this thing. And uh, maybe in another video we can do some troubleshooting and try to get it fixed. Uh, I've also thought about doing thermal mods to it, although I'm a little nervous to do any more modifications to this computer. Uh, we could also do different sorts of Linux distros and, and see what works best on there. Because when I was doing the benchmarking, I found that Linux Mint had actually scored quite low compared to OS X Catalina, which was curious. I, I'm not sure why that happened, so I'd like to see if maybe a lighter distribution would perform a little better. Uh, I hope that you found this video helpful or entertaining or both, and until next time, have a wonderful day, and thank you for watching.